All right, so we've gone through the fuel tanks to our turbo pumps. So now what happens when we get into the combustion chamber, the actual thing that is ultimately giving us our lift? So we've got two things. We've got the actual combustion chamber here, then a little throat where it gets narrow, and then the actual nozzle. nozzle. Yep. And so the combustion chamber is another thing that very often goes wrong. Okay. So what you've got to do is you've got to squirt your fuel and your oxidizer yep. and then set fire to them. What could possibly go <laughs> yeah, wrong? Exactly. Nothing has ever gone wrong in that statement. So in one thing that go wrong is let's say you squirt it in and it builds up and you can't quite ignite it. Yep. And it all ignites at once. Yep. That would be a rapid, uncontrolled <laughs> explosion. Yes. So it's got to be burning continuously. A lot of instabilities can happen here. Yeah. Maybe the, the, the uh, temperature oscillates or you get sound waves bouncing backwards and forwards inside it so it combusts more on one side than the other. And this is the bane of a lot of early rocket engineers, mm. that their, the thing would be constantly vibrating and screaming and tear itself to pieces. So it, it was for all time very much a black art, how you actually design, how you inject these things. Yep. And I know for some of the more recent rockets, people they were trying to dig out of retirement some of the old people who worked back in the 60s to say, how do we build this thing? And a lot of it was trial and error. Yeah, yeah. Um, for the Saturn V, sent people to the moon, this is the uh, what injects the fuel into the the chamber here. It's got a huge number of holes drilled in with pipes yeah, it, behind it. It looks like a waffle or something almost. <laughs> Yes, so you're squirting large amounts of you know, be fuel from one oxidizer from another, mm -hmm. uh, and then many different shapes have been used. SpaceX uses a pinkle, which is a sort of like a, a like a garden sprinkler. Okay, it squirts things out from the center. Okay, because it allows it to actually throttle up and down and change uh, the okay. actual rate. Yep. Um, but that's the, that's the first thing you've got to inject it, and exactly how you inject it is going to control exactly how smoothly it burns. Yep. and that's very hard. It's becoming easier now. We have. Um, better simulations yeah but of course you then got the combustion taking place which means uh, how do you mix the fuel and the oxidizer and does it burn smoothly or is it yep. uneven a lot of things that can go wrong this is the injector for the v2 rocket okay and so you can see it comes in here and it's squirted out of the nozzles in there okay and that's inside the chamber here yeah this is yep. the, the top of the combustion chamber so again the combustion chamber has been part of rockets for a very long time You've got to ignite it. Okay. Got so you got it in it. the combustion chamber, yes, and obviously you need to ignite those two. You light the top match yeah, and throw, and throw them. <laughs> Not a good idea. No, that's right. That would be the worst job I think you could imagine, but yes. Yes. So one method that's used is you actually remember that you've got these hypergolic fuels. And that they, was in the solid state rockets we often looked well, at. Well, they're liquid hypergolics yes. where you just combine them and they catch fire all by themselves. Yep. And often, this is for example what the Falcon does, they'll have some of these, a little slug of them that goes in first to light it. And then once it's on flame, then you then can just switch to your normal that's fuel. That's right. Or you can have something like a giant spark plug. Okay. Um, the fuel full flow engines for the Raptor, yep. they'll need the spark plugs in those pre-burner. Oh, because then, they're starting it there, that's because right. Because it's already partially burnt when it enters the main thing. It turns out that the, uh, the methane and the liquid oxygen, at, when they're already partially burnt and that's hot, are hypergolic and will ignite themselves. Oh, okay. So it's still all about solving, though, that initial ignition, whether it's in the combustion chamber, or as he said, higher above in the, the newer model. somewhere you've got to ignite it. Yep. Um, then you've got the actual nozzle. Okay. Now, what you've got is you've got to turn heat into motion. Yes. So it gets very hot, therefore it expands. Yep. Now, normally when you try and push gas through something, like you've got a hose pipe, if you narrow yep. the nozzle, it squirts out faster. That's right. Now that works when things are subsonic, below the speed of sound. Okay. And that's the case in the combustion chamber. Yep. So you narrow it down to get it to go faster. That's right. But then when things are supersonic, it goes the other way around. Oh, okay. You actually have to widen things to make it go faster. Okay. Actually more like traffic flow. Yep. Uh, tra cars go faster on a wide road than a narrow road. That's right. So, and the nozzle is where the gas hits the speed of sound. Oh, okay. And then, uh, th the throat, sorry. And yep. then the yeah, nozzle, it where it gets wider, and then allows it to accelerate. So we're going subsonic here uh, in the chamber. We're mixing at the throat, which we now turn to supersonic, which we now expand in our nozzle. And the gas is so hot and high pressure, that means that the actual speed of sound is much faster here than it would be in outside air. Yep. So it's okay. not, not the speed of sound you can look up for Mach 1s. is already going much faster than Mach 1 when it goes through there. Yep. And then it flies out to the other end. And of course, as we talked about earlier, we want the maximum possible speed at the other end, because that's in the rocket equation what's going to help us. Exactly, that's right. You want to expand it out until it, heat, it reaches the same pressure as the outside. Okay. Which means that you want to expand it a bit less at sea level compared to something that's only firing in space when there's a vacuum outside. That's what I'm saying, yeah. So this needs to be able to change or make different versions of them in the rocket. 
Yes, yeah, so what's normally done for simplicity's sake, rather than have changing it, they just have a uh, the second and third stages, which are only going to fire when it's already fairly high up, will have the nozzle going a bit further yep. than the ones that launch from the ground stage. Because if this was movable, that's just more parts and complexity that can go wrong. Ultimately. And it's going to be pretty hot. That's right. So here is the... Uh, uh, Falcon, this is the top end one, so this is the more extended nozzle from the top stage. And you can see it heating up pretty quickly. And this is in real time, right? So we yes. heat it up in a few seconds. So the next, the final problem is how do you stop the whole nozzle from melting? Yes. Uh, especially if you want, when you want to reuse. Yep. The top stages of the Falcon are not reused. But That's right. In this case, it's being cooled down because it's radiating the heat away. It's already in space that so can radiate. Ah, the so heat you're away. using the natural radiation, uh, radiating of the heat to. But that still cool limits it. the temperature you can raise it to. Yep. Um, what most of them do is so-called regenerative heating. Okay. So cooling. So what you do is your fuel instead of going straight from the turbo pump into the uh, combustion chamber, you first of all run it through a network of holes okay. around, particularly around the throat, because that's where there's the maximum heat loading, but also all the way down the nozzle. Yep. So that keeps it cool and also has the benefit of heating up your fuel. Yeah, okay. So it arrives back in your turbines already heated. So you use a natural heat exchange essentially from the hot fuel here to the cool fuel so that you keep both in chip balance and make it easier ultimately up here. Yes. So for example, this was done again, those Germans in the V2, there you see there's a hollow space between the Oh, so, so this, was, this was the fuel flowing around into here, then that actually came into the combustion chamber. Yes, so once again, they used that f flow of fuel to try and draw away the heat so that your nozzle doesn't get unbearably hot in your combustion chamber mm -hmm. and in the uh, preheats your fuel so, before you inject it in. So. I mean, it is quite amazing, right? We, we said at the beginning, it hasn't changed that much in 70, 80 years, and you kind of see that. Yes. Another technique that's used um, sometimes is that in your combustion chamber, you can uh, inject, measure, uh, injecting oxygen yep. and fuel, but maybe around the edge you can inject a mixture which is not very balanced. Okay. Typically mostly fuel and not so much oxidizer, mm -hmm. which means the very outer region won't burn very well. Yep. And that means you get a cool layer of gas that's then flowing along the inside out. Oh, okay. And, and this was the Saturn V, right? This is not used in many rockets. Yep. Um, I'm not sure if the Saturn V used it, but it's certainly a quite a common procedure yep. to have this layer of cold, not so combusted gas along the outside to insulate the nozzle from the much hotter gas in the middle. So you're kind of doing somewhat similar to what we just before, but in the actual chamber itself now, yes. that acts as kind of this cooling layer. And they're probably going to want to do all these things if possible, because you want the gas to be as hot and as high a pressure as possible That's without right. melting your whole uh, nozzle, which yep. would not be a good thing. No.